Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you guys enjoyed that extra hour of sleep or something. Wasn't that fantastic? Yes, love it. We're gonna also enjoy casting everything else aside and just enjoy our Lord and all the things that he's done. Come on. And I'm Jade. And we've got this week's Up and Up for you. So if you're new to GCC, we want to welcome you. As our guest, we have something special just for you. We call it Generations in Five. At Generations in Five, we will share with you who we are, 
what we believe, and why we do what we do. This only lasts five minutes, and we have a special gift for you as our thanks for choosing to spend part of your weekend here with us. So after the service, stop by the front of the stage, and we look forward to meeting you. Between our two campuses, we are committed to providing meals to those in our communities this Thanksgiving. And Trinity will be filling boxes again this year in partnership with Metropolitan Ministries and in Spring Hill we'll be filling bags for Jericho Road Ministries. This is the last weekend to pick up your box or bag of Hope's Giving and bring it back with you next weekend. Stop in the gathering and get all the details you need to fill yours today. So today we have a big announcement for you. No, I want to tell them. No, I want to tell them. Come on, Mom, let me tell them. Okay, fine, only because I love you. This weekend we kick off our next season of Go Adventures by announcing our 2018 trips. We went to North Carolina last year to visit JARS and it was a moving experience for us. There are trips for adults, families, and teens. Really something for everyone. And it was really amazing. Check out this short video from many of last year's trips. From Africa to Asia, Central America, and cities around the U.S., God is working in incredible ways. Find some really great treasures from many of these trips and information at the Marketplace set up in the gathering. Now let's get back to our service. God, we just lift up this next song to you in thanks that you never leave us behind. You always come after us. For I spoke a word, you sing over me. You've been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. Oh, you've been so, so kind.
mountain you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me
Till all my fears are gone So I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God Chosen me, love has called my name. I've been born again, yes, into your family. Oh, your blood flows through my veins. So I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am.
feels so good to have that weight lifted off of our shoulders of that fear. It's so good to be a child of God. If you guys can, I know you guys just sat down. You guys just sat down. We're it's packed in here. If you guys can, move a little bit in the center. Everywhere you go. That'd be so helpful. Thank you so much for anyone doing that. Yesterday was a crazy cool day in the aspect that we had four baptisms. And there were these kids that were just proclaiming that Jesus Christ is their savior and so many awesome things. There's their names and pictures, I think, going up on the screens. It was awesome. And we just want to celebrate as one church that all these lives are being changed and they're just being obedient in that fact that they're getting baptized right after realizing that they are children of God now. And so I hope that you guys can celebrate with them, with their families, with this church family. It's just awesome to see. Man, isn't it cool to see all those kids giving their life to Christ, being baptized? Absolutely. And man, I love that those pictures were up on screen right before we take communion as a church family. If this is your first time with us, know that how we do communion is as the trays are being passed. If you're a believer in Jesus, feel free to take the juice and hold it and take the bread and hold that as well. And uh, you know, I, I, I love this picture of baptism, right? Because Baptism is uh, showing us what a commitment has already been made in the heart of a person. As they go down into the water, it's like when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our old self goes away, it dies. And as they come up out of the water, it's showing that new life in Christ that we have through accepting Jesus Christ. And right now, as we get ready to take communion, this is your time to just spend some time with the Lord to say, God, thank you so much for what you did for me by dying on the cross. And to be able to get right with him on some things and maybe confess some sins to him. You know, because as Christians, we believe what is up here on this back screen, that we have been crucified with Christ. And so as you prepare your hearts to take communion, I wanna challenge you, read this scripture up here, pray to God, and when you're ready, go ahead and take that communion. And I will come back out here in a moment and pray with us. Will you pray with me? Father God, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who came and died on the cross for our sins so that we might live, live better lives here on earth, but God, live with you in heaven someday as well. God, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. God, it's in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, now we are entering into our time of offering, and uh, as the bags are being pl- passed, that's an opportunity for you to be able to give. Also, we have um, some different ways as well through our church app and online. Um, that's the way that my family, that we give through uh, online. We just set it up, and it withdraws every couple weeks for us. But, you know, I was encouraged this last month, our children's ministry was talking to our students about stewardship the whole month. It was awesome seeing our kids get this idea that everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to Him. And so when we get this, like our kids, it just causes us to say, man, I want to give. I want to be obedient to God because it's all His anyways. And so if you're in that place today, I want to encourage you, uh, be generous as God calls us to be generous. And uh, during this offering time, we have one of our ministry partners. Um, Mike is here with CMF, our CFR, and he's going to be uh, sharing with you a little bit about what they do. But before that, we have a video for you. So check this out. Do you ever wish you could make more of a difference in the world, support more ministries, reach more people with the gospel? Today, there are thousands of great Christian causes to support and countless ways you can reach people with the power of the gospel, both at home and abroad. 
If you have ever wanted to support more Christian ministry, you can by investing at Christian Financial Resources. More than just another investment that pays you interest, an investment at Christian Financial Resources enables ministry, builds churches, and results in changed lives. When you invest at Christian Financial Resources, you fund ministry and change lives while earning a competitive interest rate by enabling CFR to provide loans to Christian churches. At these churches, the next generation of children and grandchildren learn to follow Jesus, and people far from God begin to explore what it means to have a relationship with Him. It's simple and easy to get started. If you've been saving for a future purchase or you have retirement funds in a 401k from a former employer, you can invest those resources to fund more ministry and change more lives with Christian financial resources. Invest in more, more ministry, more churches, more changed lives. To learn more or to get started, call 800-881-3863 or visit cfrministry.org. Well, it's great to be here to worship with you. My name is Mike Kokolowski. I'm with Christian Financial Resources. And since 1980, CFR has been focused on one thing, funding ministry so lives can be changed. And the way our ministry works is simple. Thousands of families have invested a portion of their, their savings, their retirement funds, their old 401ks, their emergency accounts at CFR so we can help churches like Generations buy land and build buildings and make improvements and add campuses, all for the glory of God and to help grow His kingdom. And I found there are three main reasons why people invest at CFR. First, they love the interest rates we're able to pay. They're higher than what you might expect. And you can transfer money directly from your bank checking account to your CFR ready cash account. So doing transactions online could not be easier. Second reason is people love helping churches. The local church is the hope of the world. And then the third reason is people love being a part of something that is making a difference for eternity. Our theme for 2017 is invest in more. And that's so appropriate because we're now managing almost $400 million. That just means we can help more churches than we ever dreamed possible. We have 31 projects under construction or nearing completion around the country right now. That's the most in our history. So when you invest at CFR, you're helping make those projects become a reality. I wanna say a special thank you to all our investors from Generations. You all have invested almost $4 million into 57 different accounts. We could not do what we do without you. So thank you very much. Yes. If you want to find out more, just come talk to me after our time of worship. I'll be out in the gathering, and I can give you an investor's packet you can take home and read, answer any questions you have. But thanks for helping us fund ministry and change lives. And now I'm looking forward to hearing my friend Greg bring us the final message in the series, Outpour. Generations, how are we? Is everybody good? Good to see you. Beautiful day. Beautiful day. Really want to encourage you to join me and let's welcome Spring Hill. I mean, they're nailing it. They're just, they're all of us up there. It's like, cool. Welcome Spring Hill. It's live. They're all of what we are, they are. And uh, it's been great to see what God's doing there. Also want to encourage you to seriously talk to Mike uh, about our, they are a ministry partner during the worst recession of my lifetime. Uh, we were able to work with them to get the funding we needed to even land in this place. We were caught right in the middle in construction and they were great, great help for us. And it is a great way to uh, not only invest your money, but help ministry. With that, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask you to join me. And uh, let's ask God to help each one of us in the next step of our spiritual journey. Father, we're all on this journey of life. It's physical and it is spiritual. 
And I do pray that your word would help us gain understanding. And then it's our responsibility how we respond to your truths. <clears throat> and I pray that you would help each one of us take that next step into your amazing grace. And so give us understanding and guide us. And like everyone in the room, I ask for and thank you for forgiveness of sin and that amazing grace that comes through Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. You know, I heard a story of a guy who took some emergency response training. He got a certificate. He's kind of a prideful guy, so he got a beautifully framed, hung it on his wall. Literally, just a few days later, he's in a public parking lot, and there's a guy laid out on the ground, another guy kneeling over him. So he pulls his car to a stop right beside him. He jumps out. He said, I've been trained in emergency responses. Move aside. And so the guy kneeling over him says, well, OK. okay. And he kind of humbly moves moves over to the side, <clears throat> and then he pauses and says, well, you know that part where you say, call for the doctor? I'm here. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great illustration of humility and pride, and it's what I want us to talk about today. Here's the thing about humility. We tend to think that humility is weakness. It is not. True, authentic humility is strength under control. That's my definition for it, strength under control. Humility is not being self-conscious. It's not insecure. It's not timid. It's not shy. It's not a demeanor that we put on or a show. It is strength, true strength under control. True humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. You get the difference? It's not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of self less. All right, now, that becomes, in reality, humility, a priority. It is a decision that you make on how you're going to live out your life, how you talk, how you interact and react with others. Now, the world completely you know, it's a complete polar opposite. It's a full 180 degrees from what the world tells us. And that is me first, then my family, my stuff, and then we'll see about others. But we who are Christians are called to this total polar opposite lifestyle. And it makes no sense in the world that we live in to people until they come to know Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. Because for us, it's Jesus others, and then you. In other words, Jesus, others, you. And it spells, if you'll notice, joy. In other words, for us to have a joy-filled life, we have to get our priorities aligned with God's priorities, and that's it. But that makes no sense to the world that we live in. But that is the pathway to joy. And it is also a pathway that will lead you into living humbly. And that's the sweet spot of life. Now, just the, the dictionary definition of it, humility is freedom from pride or arrogance. Arguably one of the keenest minds of the 20th centuries and authors is C.S. Lewis, who was not a Christian for a long time. Later in his academic career, <laughs> became a Christian and wrote some amazing works. And this is what he says about pride. The essential vice, the utmost evil... Notice that utmost, in other words, there's no higher. Utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. In other words, all these evils flow from pride. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. In other words, pride is a, I don't need you, God. You may be there, but I don't need you. It's self-glorification, not giving God credit for who he is and what he has done. Now, he goes on to say, say, say it like this. He says, pride has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. He hangs a lot of issues of the human race, the human family, on pride, and rightfully so. Nations divide against nations, and the root of that is pride. They want power. They want money. They want dominance. They may hate the other. It's like Iran may hate uh, Israel and want to destroy it, but it, the very core of it, the root of all that is pride. You see it right 
right down into the family like he talks about. Husband and wife. Pride in the fight goes on. He said, she said, you know, kids, you know, to their parents, pride and separates them. Parents sometimes need to be apologizing to their kids because of pride. Sometimes it's in the neighborhood. Sometimes it's in the workplace. Pride is always dividing and it's always creating issues. So I'm just going to do a little pride test. All right. Just think, you rate yourself, and of course you don't have to say anything out loud, but one low, five high. Have you thought or said anything like this, let's say, in the last 30 days? I don't need directions. Guys, you better rate yourself high on that one. <laughs> now, if you're married and you're sitting next to your husband and you think, well, I'm not a prideful person, but he sure is. Well, you need to put a five on every one of yours, all right? <laughs> Just telling you, you got an issue? <laughs> all right. Here's another, I don't need counseling. You may need it, but I don't. Here's one, you know, I can do it by myself. Boy, I'm glad I don't look like she does. I'm glad I look the way I look. Or that dude really is overweight. I'm glad I'm not like that. Or I'm glad I've got more than he's got. I mean, have, have you ever had any of these thoughts or said any of these things? Or like, I can do this all by myself. That's when the lawyer begins to think he can win any case. The doctor begins to get a God complex. The business person begins to think, hey, I know how to make money. I know how to manage money. I, I do you notice that? It's pride driven. I actually saw an article as I was getting ready for this. It was entitled, get a load of this. This is a title. I, I quote, how humility will make you the greatest person ever. <gasps> Excuse me? <laughs> how humility will make you the greatest person ever? It's like, really? I didn't even bother reading that one. Right, here's the essence here. This is the core that we need to understand. Pride happens when the human family or the human being subconsciously or can be conscious. But we aspire to the status and position of God. We want to take his position and refuse to acknowledge our dependence on him. That's when pride grows. Now, we've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to hit the two biggest ways this impacts, in a negative way, the human race. Then we're going to look at God's promises for the humble. And last, then, okay, what are some very basic steps that we could take to live in humility? Here's the first one, and it's the, it's the architect where it breaks it all down in the human family. Pride steals God's glory. God's word for us who are Christians, we say the Bible is our final authority for faith and practice. In other words, how we live. This is what God's word says about it. This is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord. This is what we need to understand about pride. <clears throat> There's tons of different ways. Like, I can be proud of my looks. I can be proud of my figure. I might have used to be proud of my hair, which don't, don't have to worry about that one anymore. Proud of my athleticism. Proud of my ability to make money. Proud of my house. Proud of my motorcycle. Oh, I do like my motorcycle. Well, you know, there's lots of ways you can have pride, right? But it all funnels into one bottom line. And that is self-glorification. Self-glorification robs God of his glory. It began with Adam and Eve when they felt like the temptation. We could be like God rather than just worshiping God. Began there. It's been the human dilemma and problem ever since that time. Self-glorification robs God of his glory. So when we boast, it separates. When we're prideful, it separates us from God, just like it did the first human family, Adam and Eve. So it begins there, but here's the second one. Pride destroys relationships. Pride will always impact our human relationships. And this is what the word says about that. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Here's the thing. <clears throat> Behind every little ounce of prejudice is pride. Pride is driving it. 
It's you thinking you are better than someone else, maybe because of their social economic status, or perhaps they have a different skin color, or they don't believe like you do, or their political views are different. Pride will divide and ruin human relationships. It's that element of comparing ourselves, or I compare me against you, and I feel better about myself because I look down on you. In some way or in some fashion, pride just fuels, fuels the broken relationships and arrogance and judging of others. And what I love about our church here is we have worked really, really hard to tear down those boundaries and let everyone know Everyone is welcome here. Everyone is welcome here. You may be seated beside somebody very wealthy or very poor. Your ethnic background does not matter here. Your economic status does not matter here. Your gender does not matter here. Your political views does not matter here. In fact, you know, some we even allow cat lovers in here. Can you believe that? <laughs> now, now that I'm in trouble with some of you, I'm going to go all the way. <laughs> Anybody have some? We even let Ohio State fans in here. <laughs> and they got thumped by an unranked team yesterday. It was awesome. God is good. <laughs> and if you want to complain to the elders, go ahead. I'm no longer the lead pastor here. <laughs> so, so go ahead and complain. Send me the emails and we'll have a good old time. No, in truth, you <laughs> The truth, I really praise God for all of you. I really do. It's been 15 and a half years that, that I was here in position. And you know something? I love every one of you in the room, even if you're just visiting. You've been enriched my life and my wife's life. Becky, I want to thank you. You're just great. I want to thank you. I want to thank you. I really do thank you. So here's, here's what the word says. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and re be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Now, <clears throat> when we started this series... We read this as a number of other scriptures, but we read this as well. What I love about God's word is how you can look at the same scripture, but through a different lens. And we saw it then, and I want to reemphasize it. There's two things here. The importance of relationship to God. It's higher than even giving back to him. And giving to God is essential. That's the second part of this message here. The gift, or the, what we call the 10% or the tithe, is absolutely essential. But to God, relationship is higher value than money. And we worship a God that does not change. In Malachi chapter 3, it tells, it tells us very clearly God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it goes on to say in that same chapter that the entire nation of Israel was under a curse because the people were withholding their tithe or giving back to God. They were building their houses, building their businesses, having their fun, buying their food, selling their wares, so on and so on. But they didn't give back to God and it put the whole nation in a place that God could not bless. And they were under a curse. Notice it says, first go and be reconciled. The high value that God has on relationships. Pride destroys them. Pride is what is that meltdown, the root of a meltdown ultimately in a marriage or between a, a, a child and, and his parents or her parents. Be reconciled. Then come and offer your gift. Now, <clears throat> Here's, here's something that, that's very, very important to realize. Giving is important. It says here, then come and give. It didn't say be reconciled and go to Starbucks and forget your gift, all right? Just a little reminder there. It's important. <laughs> but here's some more scripture here. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. <laughs> If we walk in the light, we're fully transparent. Our yes is yes, our no is no. People know they can trust us. They know how we act and how we live. But to walk in the light is to put pride aside, 
put on humility, which we're going to go into now, and be willing to repair human relationships where they are broken. Now, I want to give you 12 powerful words, really simple words, but some of the hardest words for people to say. 12 powerful words in sets of three, okay? I was wrong. You were right. Please forgive me. I love you. (laughs) Do you know how many husbands and wives need to say that to each other? And how many, lots of times, kids need to say it to the parents. <laughs> and, but even parents to their kids, and it happens between best buds and girlfriends. And them. You know, I was wrong. You were right. Please forgive me. I love you. Now, let me see if you can even say those words, all right? And this is how we're going to see if you can even say them. Okay, you repeat after me, all right? I was wrong. I was wrong. Aha, you can. You were right. You were right. Look at your husband if you're married, will you? <laughs> Please forgive me. I love you. Just imagine how many relationships would be healed if people really just use those 12 simple words in sets of three. All right, the Bible talks about how pride destroys our relationship with God, separates us, and it destroys our relationship with other people. But the Bible also gives us God's promises for those who walk humbly with him. And here's the first one. I'm gonna, I only have time for, for three of them. <clears throat> but here's, I'm going to give you what I call the big three, the top three. God promises to save us. Notice what he says here. You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. In other words, are prideful. What we have to understand here is humility is that starting point of a relationship with God. You cannot enter into a relationship with God without coming in humbly because what you're doing, all of us that are Christians know what I'm talking about here. We come to Jesus Christ as sinners. We've got nothing to bring but our bondage and our brokenness and our sin. That's the only thing we have to give him. And he gives us freedom from sin and forgiveness of our sin and the grace and mercy that we need because he died on a cross carrying our sin. So now the payment of human sin is done. It's over. It's paid for. It's like it was really cool. I was at Zen Forest having dinner with my wife and I asked for the bill and somebody came up and said, hey, Somebody already picked up your check. There's somebody on the table next to me. I didn't even recognize the person next to me, but I love them already. <laughs> but it's like, wow, that was cool. Well, that's what Jesus did for us, and he paid it. It's gone. Now, this is really important to understand. This is a big take home for you. Humility is not a feeling. A lot of people mistake that. It's not an outward demeanor. A lot of people can fake humility. Humility at its root is beginning with a right relationship with the God of heaven and earth. And it comes through Jesus Christ. That's the impetus, the beginning of humility. Notice what it says here. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. In Hebrew, that word also means salvation. In other words, he crowns the humble with salvation. With salvation. Maybe God has brought somebody in here today and you have struggled with pride and it has impacted your relationships or perhaps your finances or perhaps it's put you at risk in some way. If you will humble yourself before the Lord God, he will crown you with salvation. Here's the second one. God promises to guide us. His promise to the humble is he will guide you. And look how he does it. It's so beautiful. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Two things. He guides, in other words, directs you, and he's teaching you. He's giving you both sense of direction and understanding and wisdom. Now, wisdom, we have to understand, is knowing God, knowing God's will, God's truth, that's why getting into God's word is so important, God's love, experiencing and knowing it, and then applying it. That's when wisdom comes full circle. Sometimes you have big decisions. You need the discernment. You need the guidance, and you need the understanding to base your decision from, and God wants to give that to you. But in the day-to-day activities of life, he wants to do the same thing for you. 
Even in those day-to-day mundane decisions, he wants to be there and giving you guidance and then the wisdom behind it to make good decisions for your life. Here's the third one. God promises to give us rest. This is a big one. Take my yoke, this is Jesus speaking, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Notice that. You will find rest for your souls. Here's that unless you're a Christian and fully surrendered, you can't fully grasp what he's talking about here. But what Jesus is trying to tell you, and if you're not a Christian, this is what he wants for you to actually experience. And that is that supernatural ability that God gives you to find peace and security and balance as well as joy in your life, even in times of hardship. I mean, even if you're not a Christian, you know somebody that seems like, wow, how do they move through that issue and seemingly still have joy? Because they've plugged in that supernatural ability for peace, security, balance, and even joy in the middle of life's storms. Maybe you're facing right now challenges at work or in your neighborhood or in your family or with your health or some of you students in your school programs. God's not going to make problems disappear, but his promise is I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And he'll give you insight, wisdom, stamina, and strength to make it through. Notice what he says here. Um, He says, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. As we move through these storms of life, and we all have them, he will take us through them. And in due time, we'll see how he's taught us and led us and blessed us even in the midst of a storm. Now, I don't know where you are in your life or what's going on right now, but are any of these three promises not being fulfilled in your life right now? Do you... Is, is, is perhaps are they missing? In other words, are you at a place where you need some forgiveness because you've been involved in some sort of sin or secret sin? Are you in a place in your life where you need discernment and guidance because you're about to make a major decision? Are you at a place where you're just flat, soul weary and needing the rest and comfort of a loving God? Or are you at the place, the beginning point, where you need salvation? Here's the thing about the Bible. It says that we need to put on humility using the imagery of clothes. That is, unless you live in a land of lakes and some of those communities, they take clothes off. (laughs) But this is, we're talking about putting clothes on like we do in the morning when we get up. All of you clothe yourselves, notice that, with humility toward one another. Clothe yourself. There's something you put on on a daily basis, in other words. Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. He come back to that key word, humble. So the question is, how do you put on humility on a day-to-day basis? I'm going to just give you four real quick. We're going to run through them for, the, for lack of time. There's, you could put a lot on this list, but again, it's, it's my top four. And I'm going to put it plural because I'm in this same boat with you. I'm a sinful, broken human being in need of God's amazing grace and forgiveness, just like every one of you in here and on this planet. So acknowledge our mortality. We have one life to live and one to give. You've got a start date. You've got an end date. How are you going to live it? This is going to be pride-driven, ultimately, and you trying to be Lord of your life. You won't call yourself, but that's what it is. Or are you going to humble yourself before the Lord God Almighty and allow Jesus to be Lord of your life and take you through your life? It's one or the other. James makes it very clear. Your, your life, your very life is like the dew in the morning. It's there for a short while and then it disappears. Over the span of human time, I don't care how many years you have, it is a, it's like dew over the span of all of human time and eternity. You've got this tiny little bit. How are you going to live it? What kind of imprint are you going to have left? Prideful people always leave an imprint of distaste for those who live beyond them. Humble people always leave that imprint of great memories. Memories are going to be either good or bad of a person that's departed. There's nothing in between. All right, here's the second one. 
admit our mistakes. Those of you who know the Bible, you know that one of the first verses everybody learns, Romans 3.23. It says something like this. Some have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That doesn't sound right to me. I don't, I don't think I got it quite right. Let me try again. Okay, a few have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No, you're giggling. I still didn't quite get it, did I? I don't think I'm, I'm close. I'm getting close. Okay, most of you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. <laughs> most of you, right? <laughs> That's not right either. <laughs> Here it is. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is not one perfect person here. Sorry to hurt your feelings, but <laughs> all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not one person here can save themselves from their sin. Not one. And it's pride that keeps us separated from God and acknowledging that. Here's a third one. <clears throat> Let's not take ourselves too seriously. I mean, come on. Let's just not be too serious about it. I mean, we get, you know, too uptight, too intense over life and situations, but let's not. It's interesting to me, the same root word for human humility and humor. Same root word is humus. And you know some what that means is to be thoroughly grounded. Can you laugh at yourself? Or even more, can you let somebody else laugh with you and maybe even at you? Let's just kind of... Let's not be so intense. Let's love God, love each other, and love the world around us, and God's going to do great things in and through us. Practice servanthood. <clears throat> Big question, how are you serving others now? Are you serving others now? Where are you serving others now? What are you doing for others? If you are, if you are not doing anything for anyone, then you got an issue with pride. No offense, but it's true. You got an issue with pride because it's all self-seeking now. Me, mine, and then we'll see. And there's, there's nothing left over. See, there's tons of opportunities to serve here at GCC. You can go on our website. We have lots of opportunities. And we talk about serving here on campus, serving community, serve on a go adventure around the world. And we'll be printing and publishing those, I think, starting even this weekend about all the trips around the nation and the world that we'll be taking next year. Now, it's very, very fitting <clears throat> that we started this series with love. Because bottom line, if you're not a loving person, that's it. Game over. It's a full stop right there. Unless true, authentic love for God flows out through you by genuinely not judging others, but loving them. And it is very fitting that we wrap up this series called Outpour, because that's what God wants us to do if we claim to be his people, to outpour these values of joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. God wants us to be pouring this out. The gentleness is humility. And it's very fitting that we wrap up with that joy that is Jesus others than you, because God's will is for you to be a powerful force for him in your marriages, in your homes, in your communities, and in this world, in your workplaces. God's heart is to do something in and through you. Imagine this, some 3,000 of us between here and Spring Hill will be gathering to worship him. Imagine if we all embrace these three promises of God for his humble people and actually clothe ourselves with humility and go out of this room and really extend God's love in a humble, gracious way to the world around us. Imagine how many people 3,000 of us could influence in just seven days. It's unbelievable what God wants to do here in Trinity and Spring Hill. But every one of us have to make that priority choice to clothe ourselves with humility, that is, surrender our lives to the God of heaven and earth. For even the Son of Man, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now think about what he did here. It's absolutely incredible. He left his internal position, creator of the universe. He gave up his divine prerogatives. I mean, this is a God that's timeless. He gave them up to be fixed at a point in human time in a human body. Why? To die on a cross for our sin. Researchers say dying on the cross is the most painful, excruciating, painful death ever devised by the human family. Aren't we great? And he took that so that 
he would wear our sin and that in him we could be saved. The worst tragedy that a human could ever experience is to live their whole life hearing this good news about Jesus Christ and because of pride, never surrendering to him. And that would be the only thing that would hold a person back. I'm going to ask the band to come out because you know something? That song, Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down, fights till I'm found. Now, look, focus on this. Leaves the 99. He says, I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. The overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Focus on that 99. It's a direct reference to Luke 15, where Jesus tells a story. And the story is about God, who has this 100 sheep. And he leaves the 99 in a safe place. And he goes in search of the one that's lost. This is my question. Are you the one that's lost today? Are you the one that God's searching for today? He leaves the 99 he's searching for you. Are you one that's, that's never surrendered to Jesus? He's searching for you today. Are you the one that came to Jesus and walked away from him? He's searching for you today. I'm going to ask you to stand. Focus on those words. They're so powerful. love of God. It's for you. We have a care room at the back of our gathering here. It's our lobby. There's people there ready to talk with you if that's you. You're the one that God is coming after today. He loves you. He can't love you any more than he loves you right now. In Spring Hill, it's off to the right of stage. We're just so excited that we had this hour of worship with you. God bless, folks.